We have this idea, for some reason, that we all know what a 3D printer emits into the air, and we have this idea that we understand the health risks. And yes, some studies have been done on the topic, and I, I can't really show you them for licensing reasons, but I can talk about them, and I will. Emissions are elusive things. We as humans have the ability to detect smoke and pollution that we have evolved around mostly, and so we can smell a lot of things that smell bad to us, and that is the signal that we get that we should not be smelling that and that we should relocate. Even within that subgroup of things that we can smell, we can also be remarkably dumb about it. If you like the smell of wood smoke, for example, you might be surprised to know that that's actually hugely hazardous. And I wish someone would tell my idiot neighbours this, but the point is that we are most definitely not a reliable detector for 3D printing based particulate health hazards, not at all. This is though, this and its friend here are from IKEA. IKEA. This one is pretty useless, but they actually both work fine. I just don't like to measure things in terms of colours, uh, so you should buy this one because it just costs a, about 10 or more, I think. So these meters measure PM 2.5, which is referring to 2.5 micrometers and above in terms of the size of particles that it can detect. And we use the Greek letter micro to denote this. I did a video exactly about this over two years ago where I made my own, but you can now buy them a lot easier. For example, this one from Ikea. It's only 35 pounds, so there's not much point making your own now. Uh, you can even hack these things, which I might for the next video, because, yeah, this is a multi-part video. I didn't even get to scratch below the surface, as you will see by the end. Anyway, long story short, this is the Creality K1, which, by the way, is still working fine. I am having zero troubles with this printer. The reason I'm choosing this as the test printer for this video is because it has an enclosure with a controllable fan and it has no filtration at all, not carbon filtration, not um, paper filtration, nothing. So we have full control over what we're measuring and nothing is in theory affecting that. The first experiment was based on just extruding a known length of filament out of the printer via the filament loading function with the door closed and fans off. The loading function on the K1 does push out quite a lot of filament in quite a short amount of time. Uh, I ran it for each filament, once to purge the last one out and then clear the air, and then once for the new one. And I, I just watched what happened on the meter because it doesn't log at the moment. What was surprising is that every filament reads a value here pretty quickly. Every filament seemingly makes PM 2.5 particles. Uh, maybe that's not surprising, but the next bit is surprising, so wait for it. I rummaged through the sample box looking for just about every type of filament I have and that's why I was just extruding a little bit because these are all samples and um, that means you usually can't even print as much as a Benchy. Uh, there's quite a few samples. There were a couple of things to note. Some filaments were lower emitters than others but broadly speaking most of them were around the same. However, um, on the nose, as filament tasters might say, they were vastly different. I thought ABS was stinky because when I did the Voron project, I printed in ABS. And I'm not that fond of the smell, if I'm honest, but HDPE took a very, very long time to clear out the machine. It is horrendous. Um, the same for wood filament. The smell was more pleasant, but it is also insanely persistent. Way more than ASA and ABS. Um... Also, wood filament is very odd stuff. Um, it doesn't even extrude properly. I won't be in a hurry to print this, as I do think it's probably nowhere near as innocuous as you might think it is. Just, oh, it's natural. Um, it's PLA with just some wood in. It won't do you any harm. I think that's probably entirely false. The next tests I did were on full model prints. So basically a short print, um, something like a XYZ cube, while I'm looking at the PM 2.5 and this is where things started to get a bit weird. Where I'd seen high emissions while loading the filament, during the print, not really. Even on ABS, the values were above normal, but they were not really that above normal. We're, we're talking really almost undetectable. And on PLA, the values were not even above background. And none of that makes any sense whatsoever because 
you can smell um, ABS for sure, and you can even smell PLA. Long story short, what we're detecting is smoke particles, and when you extrude a lot of filament at the beginning of a print, you are getting smoke. You can see that. Um, hopefully I'll be able to get you some footage of that on screen. This is not normal during printing. If you're getting smoke during printing, then that's usually an indication of a problem. But it is normal when extruding manually for some reason. I don't want to get into why this is the case, but this is the first learning outcome. Loading the printer is definitely not good for you. Um, and also, people seem to think that this is steam. This is sometimes steam, but no, this is actually burning plastic. Uh, it creates a lot more PM 2.5, irregardless of the filament you're using, and typically on most printers, your face is usually quite close to the printer when doing this. So don't do that, at least um, try not to do that. Avoid breathing that smoke, that is bad for you. So that does lead us on to question two, which is what is the printer emitting for the rest of the print if it's not being detected on the PM 2.5 meter? Smaller things. It turns out that, according to some studies, smaller things than PM 2.5 could uh, pose a larger risk than your standard PM 2.5. So this is not really much to celebrate, and it's absolutely harder to detect these smaller mystery emissions. One subgroup of these smaller things that we can detect is VOCs, which stands for Volatile Organic Compounds, and I'm not a chemist, so I don't really want to go into this and get it wrong, but that is a vast range of small things that are absolutely not exclusively created by 3D printing. You pretty much create them by breathing and um, paint evaporating, uh, furniture from Ikea, so measuring these is in fact a challenge in itself, but more about that in a moment. So VOCs are exactly what this Wikipedia article says they are. Um, yeah, they are emitted by 3D printers. And I could show you in this initial test I did on a PLA print of all things. This is PLA, not ABS. This is on the P1S with the door open and the sensor just in front of it. We have uh, very clearly got VOCs. We have got lots of VOCs. Anyway, if you want to replicate the following tests, the equipment I'm using is firstly these things from a company called Mill. I don't hugely like these as they use an app and you can't really control anything or export the data and that annoys me, but they are fairly cheap, especially at the moment because I think they're clearing them out and there's no experience required and they will give you a fairly stable reading of TVOC, uh, which isn't the Vulcan guy from Voyager. It means total VOC in parts per billion and other than my gripes, these things do appear capable of telling you when you have a problem, at least eventually. The same for the IKEA meter, it has VOC detection, but unless you're willing to hack into it, which I've already said I will do, um, if I get chance, you only get a very crude trend indicator, which is an arrow that goes up or down or level, which honestly is quite useless. So how I got these charts was to go at it myself. This is a Pie Maroni breakout garden, and this is a Pi, and this is a BME 680. Long story short, I used a version of the code Pie Maroni I've provided, and I added some extra stuff in there that uploads to Adafruit's logging platform, which is really cool, by the way, it's very easy to use. I'll try to link all the code below. Uh, I'm quite happy to share it because I would like some of you to also run these experiments if you can. As things stand at the moment, and to be honest, how they may remain, uh, the VOC measurements are kind of unitless because I haven't really got that far yet. These sensors are crazy complicated. They throw out a value in ohms, which is based on the resistance of the surface they're detecting uh, VOCs on. They also need a fairly long preheat time to stabilize the readings, so they are about as fussy as sensors can get for home use. Um, to be honest, that is hindering my data collection. I'm getting used to using them, but they're not very simple. They, they don't just, just plug in and work like you would like them to, but they do ultimately give the results that we need, at least I think so. So I will show you what I've found so far. First up, we can confirm that printing just about anything creates VOCs. You already saw the PLA one. Here is the ABS equivalent. The ABS one that we see on screen now is taken from inside the closed enclosure and obviously that means that it's going to be an unrealistic scenario unless you happen to live inside your enclosure or you happen to be Ivan Miranda. Um, and here's what you tend to see if you leave your door open and the sensor is nearby in a closed room. So we do have a quick learning outcome again. Even in an unenclosed printer you can see there's a 
pretty quick fall off with distance and the size of the environment. This, this does make sense. But remember that this is a small 12 minute uh, test piece and I haven't yet got on to testing how much those levels build up over time. I'll need a, an isolated environment to do that. And I really want to emphasize that this is why every study that looks into um, this problem always seems to point to the importance above all else of air changes in the printing environment and changing the air might be easier than you think. But before we go into that, what if you could just not? I mean, what if you could print things like ABS, nylon, HDPE, and you didn't have to worry about the more horrible smells and chemicals that it creates in your environment? Well, it just so happens that the sponsor of this video might be of interest in, in, in that respect, and that is the best segue so far. PCBWay can 3D print using FDM for ABS, and they can also do nylon via MJF, uh, both of which are fairly cost-effective methods. You can even get more exotic stuff made like Peak. Uh, good luck doing that on your Ender 3. You can also get things printed by SLA or DLP so that you don't have to deal with resin fumes, which we are totally going into in a future episode because yes, I'm doing resin nasty stuff. And of course, uh, there's all the other services, including PCB manufacture, CNC, uh, sheet metal. Go and have a look and see what other services they offer. Getting stuff made by PCB Way is easy. Just upload your file, choose the options you want, and there's tool tips and help pages for anything you aren't clear on. Thank you, PCB Way, for sponsoring this episode, and let's return to the smelly stuff. So, air changers. Well, at the very basic, you could just open a window to get rid of the air. Would that work? Maybe. I've relied on opening a window for the bulk of the time that I've been printing in PLA, which is, I think that's coming up to maybe just slightly more than three years now. But while we've seen PLA definitely makes fumes, PLA has been shown to lack some of the particularly bad chemicals. I'm not saying the ones that you're breathing from PLA are good, but it definitely lacks some of the particularly bad ones that are known to cause problems that other filaments contain. So in terms of mitigating known risks, uh, maybe opening a window might work. I don't actually advise that. It's probably the least reliable way to change air in a room. If you want to do the job properly, uh, let me show you this graph. This isn't even printing VOCs, this is just grotty house air. Um, this is a really good case for extraction. It's a good case for extraction anyway. Cooking is a really big source of indoor pollution. Anyway, I've also got an extraction fan here. This is a simple thing. It cost me £37 and it's mandatory to put two lengths of ducting one either side. Um, I guess it needs that for reasons. It does essentially the same job as the aircon. It removes air from the room and that has to replace itself from somewhere, vents or whatever. This is a very cheap potential solution to the extraction problem and it would appear to be a very good solution to the extraction problem. But I do have to point out that you need to have these professionally fitted wherever you live. And I also have to point out that I am not qualified to tell you how well this works. At the end of the day, the ideal amount of exposure you want to the fumes is zero. And I don't think any of these solutions can really provide that. The best way to get zero exposure is to not be in the same place as you're printing. So that's still the best option. The final point for this episode is a quick experiment regarding enclosures, because a lot of you, when I asked, are using enclosures as a strategy to reduce fumes. Here's a graph of that with the sensor outside of the enclosure for the duration of a 12 minute XYZ cube. This is not a particularly long print. I think it's far from conclusive, but my initial reaction is that what you're seeing is kind of a long tail here while the stuff that's inside the enclosure slowly leaks out. Broadly speaking, it's just going to slowly diffuse to, through, through the room. And um, yeah, the peak levels are lower, but the VOCs, they're, they're not going anywhere. If you did also ventilate the room at all, then it might counter this effect if you're changing the air fast enough that it can't build up outside the enclosure. I mean, that, that kind of makes sense. I am hoping to do some inside, outside uh, enclosure tests for next time to get some more clarity on the comparison between the levels in, in an enclosure and how much of that is leaking outside. 
So that is all I can cover in this one. Um, I know a lot of unanswered questions remain, of course, and that's something that um, I need to take time to gather the data. I also need uh, better or more equipment. And you can actually help me out there if you're interested in this kind of thing uh, via Patreon, link below. Patreon pretty much funds the purchase of the test equipment and makes this kind of thing possible. Also, while you're uh, here, make sure you're subscribed so that you don't miss part two, which will be in about a month, I think. Uh, I've got something else to do in between, which will put this on the back burner, hopefully gathering data. And the thing between is also really interesting. I'll give you a spoiler. It's TPU again. Anyway, I will see you next time. Thank you for watching.